am going to let you in on a closely held trade secret about preaching. Sometimes on a Sunday morning, you get up and you prepare to preach and you just, something you just don't necessarily want to do. Now before you all get nervous, you, you ask yourself, you say, what's the point? And the reason that you ask yourself that is because during the service previous to you preaching, is the Holy Spirit has moved in such a way that you ask yourself, what can I say that hasn't already been said through the moving of the Spirit? So now I hope you feel a little bit better with the way I started that statement. But then you realize, then you realize that the Holy Spirit doesn't speak to everyone in the same way. And while it has moved throughout the service in that particular time, and while it has spoken through everything that has taken place before, that someone, God gave you a message for a reason, and someone needs to hear it. That doesn't make it any easier, though. That doesn't make it any easier because for you as the preacher and for myself as the preacher, the Holy Spirit has moved in such a way that you, you, that the message itself just seems anticlimactic. But it's not the case for God. Just thought that I would let you in this morning on that little trade secret. Other preachers might not necessarily share that with you, but I just thought that I would. Let us pray this morning. Dear great and merciful Heavenly Father, we thank you for the move of your spirit. We thank you for the privilege of having the Holy Spirit within us. We thank you for the ability to praise your name and to worship you. As we move forward into the next phase of our service, as we prepare for the preached word, to God, I ask that you would use me to deliver your word to your people in the way that you would have it to be delivered. I ask that you would use me to deliver the message that you have for your people to hear. And Heavenly Father, if there is someone that does not know you, I ask that through the moving of the Holy Spirit in this service that they might come crying, what must I do to be saved? We ask this so humbly, O oh God, empowered by the Spirit which you have given us, the Holy Spirit within us. In the name of Jesus we do pray. Amen. There's a story told of a young boy named Kojo. Kojo lived in a very remote village in Kenya. And he did not know Christ. And one day when he was nine, um, in the area of Kenya, there are a lot of itinerant preachers, preachers which travel from village to village. And this particular day, a preacher came to visit Kojo's village and uh, preached the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And there was something that was stirred up within this little nine-year-old boy that he decided to give his life to Christ. Now, understand what I'm saying when I say Kojo decided to give his life to Christ. Not only did Kojo come forward that day, not only was he baptized, not only did he accept Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, but Kojo gave his entire life to Christ. He wanted to do God's will. He had these dreams and these aspirations of what he could do in order to further God's kingdom and be used as an instrument for Christ. Well, another year went by. Now Kojo's 10 and the, that same preacher comes and visits his village again. And, and he's sitting there and he's talking with this preacher about all of these things that he wants to do, and he says to them, but I know I'm just a poor boy in a remote village that almost no one ever comes to. I know that all of these things that I'm dreaming about, they're impossible. So I will settle for just being able to grow up knowing the word of Jesus Christ and being able to share it 
with people in this village and the surrounding villages. That uh, preacher looked at him and had a smile on his face. He laughed. He said, oh, no, don't do that. Don't do that. You keep thinking big. You keep thinking big because although it may seem impossible to you now, understand that through God, the impossible becomes possible. So a few years go by. Kojo's now 16 years old, and at 16, some missionaries came to visit the village, and they were struck by the spirit that just exuded from Kojo, and they asked his parents, they said, can we take your son to the city? We want to get him further educated and and provide opportunities for him. His parents, understanding what type of opportunities would be, they said, oh, yes, please take him. So Kojo was taken to the city, and he finished high school there. He got an opportunity to go off to college. He went off to college, and sensing the call of God, he decided to go to seminary. He was given a scholarship to come to a seminary here in the United States, and he studied here. And and once he finished that, he he, he didn't seem like it was enough, so he went on and he, he got his Ph.D. And, and, and his doctorate of ministry. And then when all of that was done, he returned back to Kenya. He didn't return to the city, though he returned back to his home, to his village. And he became a pastor there. Many would think with all that he had invested, all of that education time that he had invested, why would he go back to this small village? There was so much more that he could have done elsewhere. And I would say that, no, that is not the case. He could not have done any more elsewhere than he was going to do there because that is where God called him to. And so... He goes on and he pastors this church, but he has these big dreams and he has these things that he sees within his village. And and he goes and he works with other villages and they form a co-op and all of a sudden the crop yields are much better than they used to be. He starts a school, a, a, a little Christian school that not only the people in that village, but people from other villages can come to. One of the villages that did not know Christ, almost 100% of that village were transformed and changed and gave their life to Christ. Kojo looked back on it, now 32 years old, and he said, to all of this, I would have never dreamed that it it would be possible. And had it been him and his own power, it wouldn't have been possible. But through God, it was all possible. So that's what we're going to talk about today, my brothers and sisters. Think big. Think big. Because The impossible is possible. Now we know we've been in Nehemiah for the past several weeks and we're almost done. And so we're going to look at Nehemiah only two more times, this week and next week. And the text for today is actually, the entire text will be Nehemiah 6. I would encourage you to read it if you haven't been following along. Nehemiah 6, 14 through the end of the chapter. But for the sake of being able to zero in on one specific point within this verse, we're going to just look at two verses. We're going to look at Nehemiah 6, and we're going to look at verses 14 and 15. I'm sorry, 15 and 16. I will be reading from the New International Version, and I'd ask that all who could would please stand in reverence to God's word. My subject, think big, because the impossible is possible. Nehemiah 6, 15 and 16. So the wall was completed on the 25th day of Ehu, on the fifth in 52 days. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. May God add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his most holy and true word. You may be seated. All of the nations around trembled because they realized that this work had been done with the help of God. Let's look at what has been accomplished here. They have built a wall around their city, repaired it at least. And they did it in less than two months. No backhoe, no bulldozers, no cranes, none of the modern amenities that we would have to undergo a task today. And they were able to do it in 52 days. That 
is impossible. Except they were able to do it. So we ask ourselves, how is this possible? How were they able, with all of that they, that they faced, how were they able to accomplish this impossible task? They were able to accomplish it because anything's possible when we are doing what God has called us to do. And so let's look. Let's look at Nehemiah. Let's look at his Jewish brothers and sisters and let's this decipher. Let's get deeply into what was able to happen. The first thing that they did is Nehemiah, he, get, he yielded to God's vision. He yielded to God's vision. He, he matched his vision with God's vision. God had this vision of this thing that he wanted to happen. Nehemiah matched his vision with God's vision and said, I don't know exactly how it's going to be done. I don't know exactly what I'm going to have to do to achieve it, but God says it. I want to do it, and I'm going to do it. So Nehemiah had the same vision that God had. He didn't, he didn't say, well, my vision's over here, and your vision's over there, and try to do his own. He matched his vision with God's vision. Another reason that this was able to be accomplished is because the Jewish people had a unity of purpose. They had a unity of purpose. They had a mission. We need to clean up our city. We need to rebuild the wall. Our city is in rubble. We need to change that. And so they had this vision, this purpose of making sure that that happened. And because they had unity of purpose, because they were all of the same mind, they were able to make sure that they stayed focused. They didn't go off on little tangents in different directions. This is our mission. We need to rebuild the wall. We're not going to worry about all of these other things over here and over here. Our mission right now, is to rebuild the wall about around Jerusalem. And so they had this unity of purpose. They were all on the same page. Another thing that they were able to do is everybody did their part. If you go back a few sermons, you'll remember that we talked about everybody doing their part. And what happened was each family had a section of the wall to build. This family built this section, and then this family would build this section, and then this family would build this section. Now imagine how much smaller the task looks now. It isn't my job, it isn't your job to rebuild an entire wall. My job is to rebuild my section. And the person next to me will rebuild their section. And so on. Everybody did their part. Everybody built their section. And because everybody participated and did their part, the mission was able to be accomplished. 52 days, they were able to rebuild that wall. Another thing that they were able to do is these people, they faced opposition but they did it with courage and they did it with conviction. They did not let opposition stop them from doing what God had called them to do. They said, you may ridicule us, we're going to build this wall. You may threaten us, well, we're going to put on our swords, we're going to grab our shields, we will carry our spears and defend ourselves, but we're going to rebuild the wall. We may have problems internally, we're going to deal with them and continue to rebuild the wall. They did not let opposition stop them. They faced that opposition knowing that it would come and they faced it with courage and conviction that we are doing what God has called us to do and nothing that anyone, Sanballat, the Arabs, Gushim, and none of anything that anyone throws at us is going to stop us from accomplishing our Go. And so how was all of this possible? Because of the most important thing that Nehemiah and the Jewish people did. And that most important thing is they trusted God. They didn't step back and look and say, look at Nehemiah and say, man, are you crazy? You want us to put a wall around this entire city without the help of the king? You want us to do it on our own? That's impossible. They didn't say, 
Well, Nehemiah, you know, we, we, we got started, but, but Sam Ballard and the Arabs, they're, they're threatening to kill us. Maybe we should just stop. They didn't do that. They didn't say, we've got our own problems that we have to deal with. I have my own problems in my family. I have my own problems that w- within myself, I don't have time for your pet project. They didn't do that. They trusted God. And because they trusted God, they were able to achieve and make possible what should have been impossible. That's what Koji did. It is no way that he should have been able to increase crop yields within those villages as quickly as he did. It is no way that in those poor villages that they had the finances, they didn't exist to build a school that would help all of those villages. It was impossible. And even more so, here you have this this person who has gotten out of this village. He's gotten out of Kenya. He's left the continent of Africa. He's been able to achieve a master's degree and a doctorate degree. And what does he do? He goes back. That just doesn't happen unless we're doing what God has called us to do. And we as a body, a body of believers which come together and, and worship under the auspice of the name First Baptist Church. We, as a body of believers within Kiowa County, which say that we are called by Jesus Christ to do certain things, we have a mission. We have something that God has called us to, and there are going to be things in the near future that God will call us to do. We're going to look at them and say, that is not possible. Or we're going to look at them and say, you know, and there's going to be a lot of opposition to that. Or we're going to look at them and say, all right, it's just really going to be a lot of work. Think big. Because with God, the impossible is possible. So what do we have to do? The first thing we have to do is we have to take our own desires. We have to take our own Will and we have to bend our will to God's will. We have to make sure that we are on the same page that God is on. There's going to be times when you want to do this over here, but God says, I want you to do this over here. We need to be over here. And what happens is sometimes people are over here and they say, well, you know what? This is what I want to do. And they wonder, well, why is it so much of a struggle? Why is it so difficult? Why is it so hard? They may even get it achieved and they wonder, well, why don't I have any fulfillment? Why don't I have any joy in this thing that I had such a desire to do? The reason you don't have the joy is because you are trying to do what is outside the will that God has for you. That is where we find our joy. That is why Koji was able to find joy after coming over to the United States and experiencing all that is the United States. He found joy in going back to that small, isolated village in Kenya. Because he bent his will to God's will. And that's what we have to do as individuals. And that is what we will have to do as a body. It is not about what I want or about what you want. It is not about what we want at First Baptist Church. It is about what God wants. And so we must build, bend our will to God. And then after we build our, bend our will to God, we need to make sure that we have a unity, U-N-I-T-Y, unity of purpose. Unity of purpose. In other words, we are all on the same page. Now that just means that we all have the same goal. And by virtue of the fact that we're Christians, by virtue of the fact that we say we want to follow a risen Christ, we should already have a unity of purpose. Regardless of the building that we're in, regardless of the state that we're in or the country we're in, we should have a unity of purpose to live a life pleasing to Christ, to build God's kingdom. That should be our unity of purpose. Now, that being said, unity of purpose does not mean unity of idea. Now, what do I mean by that? Unity of purpose is the what. What are we trying to do? What are we trying to accomplish? We should all be on the same page with the what. Where we might differ is the how. We might see different ways of getting to the what. 
And what happens is in churches and in bodies of Christ is rather than focusing on the what, we spend so much time focusing on the how that we never get to the what. So we may have differences. We may, we may not say, well, you know what? I, I, yeah, this is what we should do, but I think we should do it like this. And say, no, oh, that doesn't work. I think we should do it like this. Well, what we have to do is we have to come together, sometimes agree to disagree on the how, just making sure that we stay focused on the what. That is our unity of purpose. We also want to make sure that everybody does their part. God has given everybody in here. He's blessed us all with gifts. He's blessed some of us with more gifts than others. He's made some gifts more apparent than others and larger than others. But we all have gifts. And part of everybody doing their part is using the gifts that God has given to you. If God has given you a gift of administration, then use that to build his kingdom. If God has given you a gift of encouragement, use that to build his kingdom. If he's given you the gift of teaching, use that to build his kingdom. But everybody has to do your part. That means you're not doing somebody else's part. When when the Jews were building the wall, if a family had this section of wall to build, you know what they did? They built this section of wall. They didn't go down the street to the Joneses and look at how the Joneses were building their wall and say, I wouldn't do that like that. I think it's an easier way. To them. Come on over here. Let me, let me tell you how to do that. No, because if you're doing that, Who's building your section? Because you're over here in this section. Everybody do their part. Because everybody did their part, the wall was built in 52 days. Because that village and all those surrounding villages came together and everybody did their part, those villages were able to thrive. When everybody does their part within the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God grows. People come into the kingdom of God, and you know the most important thing? Souls are saved. So that's how, that's how important this is. Souls are saved. So everybody does their part. The next thing that we have to realize is that we will face opposition. Anytime that you're doing God's will, the enemy is going to attack because he does not want you to fulfill the task that God has called for you to do. He will put things in your way. Last week we saw he even went as far as to try and discredit Nehemiah, hoping that the work will stop. So when we get these big tasks, when we have these big ideas, these things that seem, seem impossible, we have to realize that it's not a matter of if opposition comes, it's a matter of when and how strong that opposition will be. We just have to be prepared for it. We have to be prepared to face it because it will come. I can remember, um, I don't remember who it was that told me this story. I want to say it was Roger that was telling me a story about two years ago, maybe three, um, when a few people canceled for the block party. And now they're looking at opposition, right? Like, okay, this, this, this is not going to happen. And, and it was windy and, and the inflatables were blowing over and, and it just didn't seem like Things were going to happen the way that they were supposed to happen because opposition is coming. Well, what do you do? If it's windy and you want your inflatables, what do you do? What do you do? Well, what you do is you take all the chairs out of the sanctuary and you put the inflatables in here. You just have to, you just have to understand that opposition is going to come. We have to be willing to stand against it and know that we can stand against it because we have God on our side. And if God is for us, who can stand against us? And so that means that we have to do the most important thing, which is what Koji did, and which is what Nehemiah did, and which is what we, what we, 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 I don't keep saying me, but what we must do. And you know what that is? We have to trust God. We have to trust him. We, we, we may be looking at a situation and saying, God, that is too big for me, or that is too big for us to accomplish. And you know what? It is too big for us if we try and accomplish it without God on our side. But if God is with us, we don't have the right 
to say something is too big. Because if God is calling us to do it, he will prepare us for it. And just like a wall was built in 52 days, whatever that great task is that he calls us to do, if we do all of these things, unity of purpose, his vision, do our part, prepare for opposition. If we do all of those things and trust in God, it will happen. It's not a matter of can. It will happen because it is the will of God. We just need to trust in him. Just like Nehemiah and his brothers and sisters did. And because they trusted in God, because they said, okay, this task does seem too big for us, but we're going to give it a shot. They built a wall in record time. So my brothers and sisters, I don't know. I, I Sometimes I just wish, I'll be honest with you, sometimes I just wish when, when God was speaking and he was giving things to me, sometimes I just wish I want to say to God, just give me the whole picture. Stop giving me pieces of the puzzle. Just let me see the whole picture. Because then I, I, I know what I'm working with. So just show me the whole picture. And, and, and God doesn't listen. You know, he, he still has yet to show me the whole picture. I get bits and pieces. So I don't know what this great task, what this great undertaking that we as a body are being prepared to do is. I just know we're being prepared to do it. And, we have, and when it comes, we're going to have to be ready. I wish I could stand here and tell you, oh, yeah, this is what it is. But I can't. He won't give me the whole picture. Maybe he's given some of you some bits and pictures of the picture that he hasn't given me. But I do know it's going to seem, it's going to seem daunting. Think big. Because through God, it's impossible. Amen. Amen.